Hello, everyone. A uh, warm welcome to today's IIED Debates event. Uh, we're going to make a start now. We've got an hour and a half together for today's discussion, Why Eat Wild Meat? Insights from Africa and Lessons for COVID-19 Responses. So today's event is part of the IIED Debates series, um, but we're delighted to be co-hosting with the Interdisciplinary Centre for Conservation Science at Oxford University, the Conservation Foundation and Fondation Camerounaise Terre Vivante. So with that, uh, I am really delighted to introduce Silas Rowe, who is a principal researcher at IIED and our moderator for today's session. Silas, over to you. Thanks very much, Juliet, and welcome everybody. Thank you very much for joining us um, for the latest in our IIED debates series. So these series of webinars are really intended to bring together an international community to discuss critical issues of our time. And I really think COVID-19 is perhaps one of the most critical issues uh, that we faced for a very long time. And the issue about why wild meat consumption in the midst of, of COVID-19 um, is one that really, really requires some, some deep discussion and careful thought. So this webinar is based largely on findings from a Darwin Initiative funded project um, that IIED, together with ICCS, uh, the Conservation Foundation and FCTV, have been running for the last three years. So we started this project before the COVID-19 um, pandemic to, to really try and understand what were the drivers of wild meat, what, what, what encourages or discourages people from eating it. But actually with COVID-19, our research question has become even more pertinent. And we supplemented our main Darwin Initiative project with a COVID rapid response project, also funded by UK DEFRA, um, to really kind of pull out some insights as to the whether COVID-19 had had an impact on wild meat consumption in Cameroon, our study area for the main project. We're also delighted to link with research from the GCRF funded trade hub project, which is also looking at um, wild meat trade. So very complementary to our Darwin project. So I'm going to introduce the panelists um, to you um, one by one, and then I will be moderating a Q&A um, after each of the speakers. And then we will have two respondents following the Q&A to just set the findings of our research and some of the outputs in, the, in a broader international context. So I'd like to start by introducing um, E.J. Milner Gulland. Um, E.J. is the Tasso Leventis Professor of Biodiversity at the University of Oxford and the Director of the Interdisciplinary Centre for Conservation Science. And E.J. is going to give us a presentation to really set the scene and the context for this webinar and why we are concerned about wild meat consumption at this time. Thanks very much, EJ. Thank you, Dillis. Um, and thanks for the invite and thanks to everyone who's joined us. I'm just going to give us a broad um, overview of um, why this is an important topic that will hopefully set the context for the rest of the, um, the webinar. So, um, Last year, I'm sure many of you would have seen that there was a lot of uh, focus on, on wild meat and the wildlife trade as a result of COVID. And I've just popped up a few of the um, most widely used um, adverts that were out on social media around the place. And um, these are quite interesting. They do have a big focus on the consumption of wildlife, as you can see with the top left one. Um, and they talk about stopping the wildlife trade, both in the context of pandemics, but also in the context of conservation. Interestingly, um, I don't think elephants and tigers have, have ever been fingered as potential um, transmitters of COVID, but these are strong, powerful messages that um, have cut through. So in that context though, um, I think it's worth reflecting that um, when we're talking about the wild meat trade, what we're mostly talking about is a livelihood for hundreds of thousands of people, um, a lot of it in sub-Saharan Africa. And um, although mammals are the main focus for things like um, pandemic risk, it also covers um, reptiles, invertebrates, plants, fungi, um, birds as well. So it's a whole range of taxa. So 
not all of this is illegal and not all of this is unsustainable. So um, the context really that we're trying to focus on is, is trying to bring it down to the people who are actually using wildlife most extensively, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. I'm not saying, of course, that there isn't unsustainable wild meat use. There certainly is. And um, when we're having large scale commercial hunting for urban markets, that can um, defaunate an area. And um, also hunting for threatened species, whether it's targeted, whether it's opportunistic when you're out looking for something else, or whether it's incidental, um, can be a major issue for those species. Um, there's major concern, particularly in areas like Southeast Asia, about indiscriminate snaring causing major loss of populations of wildlife. And particular concern as well about outsiders coming to exploit the food resources of indigenous people in local communities. So just setting that in the context that, that there is a big issue. However, I hope that just those first three slides um, have demonstrated that actually there's complicated relationships between wildlife use and trade and human well-being. And if you could put this into a kind of SDGs framework, you can see positive and negative um, relationships between wildlife use and trade and um, various aspects of people's well-being. Um, so when we're thinking about all of this, we have to realize that there is a lot of nuance. And it's interesting to reflect that although, you know, there's a whole set of people who've been working very extensively on the international wildlife trade in threatened species, including, I might add, my favourite species, the Saiga, top left there. Um, there's been a whole other theme of research that's been going on for, for decades now that has been focusing more on the development side, has been focusing more on helping local people to diversify their livelihoods, which will include wildlife, but will also include agriculture in kind of mixed farming settings um, around the world. And those kinds of projects um, often all offer a range of different alternatives to uh, natural resource use. So this is one project, for example, in Tanzania that offered in the same villages and often to the same households, five different kinds of project, um, efficient fuel stoves, rabbits for meat, goats for meat and, and sale, bees, uh, the classic, and also tree planting. Um, so, you know, a lot of a lot of different ideas about how you might be able to wean people off dependence on wild meat coming uh, from conservationists. These alternative projects, therefore, tend to have two different kinds. There's the ones that try to provide alternatives to hunting, often called alternative livelihoods, and alternatives that uh, are alternatives to consuming, which is more like alternative proteins. Often these are confounded, often like in the project I just mentioned, they're being alter offered together in the same kind of village to the same kinds of people. They may of often even address the same households. So this is what we mean by alternatives projects. And they tend to have um, a relatively straightforward theory of change of this kind. This is a, a crude representation of it, that you have this problem of unsustainable use of wild meat is, is the associated problem. They think, OK, we'll provide an alternative that will allow people to switch to that alternative and then the wildlife populations will recover. So it's coming from a very conservation angle. Um, there's been a number of studies that have been thinking about what are those assumptions and are they well held up? And I guess the one by Wright et al, we identified three. The first one is that actually that theory of chains holds, that providing alternatives will reduce people's need for and desire to exploit natural resources. And that assumption is not as tested as it should be. The second one is often that um, everyone in a community feels the same about wild meat and uses wild meat in the same way. Um, and therefore, you could do something at a community level that would actually affect individual people in the way expected. And the fourth one is an important one, which I think is worth highlighting, which is this scale up to system level change, because the theory of change goes all the way from households to we're going to have a reduction in um, pressure on wildlife populations. And that also is not necessarily true. There was a really excellent study uh, by Wakanda and Code a few years ago that um, tried to see the extent to which alternative projects work. And Jasmine's going to um, give a little bit more update on this, but this was the, the one that was published in 2018 uh, with quite a wide range of case study sites. And just kind of bringing back to what I said before about that project in Tanzania, all sorts of different kinds of thing that were being offered to people 
um, poultry farming, snail farming, livestock rearing, cane rats, beekeeping, all sorts of things. This is the slide that's most important from that study, however, which just demonstrates that um, although mostly people felt that there was a small positive change both in hunting and socioeconomic um, benefits to people, most of the ecological change was unknown and the change that was um, highlighted was pretty much unproven. So it was mostly based on no data, expert opinion, and just a very few sets of data analysis. So to sum up the answer to the question about alternative livelihoods, do they work? I think it's pretty clear that there isn't enough information to know whether alternative projects are working, and particularly not enough detailed, robust studies. But it, it appears from what we know that they aren't working particularly well at the moment. And this is a conclusion that's been found by a number of authors. And that is because of design flaws and unrealistic assumptions that appear to be rife. Um, also to note that most analyses and most projects focus on livelihoods rather than consumption, even though consumption is also important. So there's a big gap to fill there. And that's where the Why Eat Wild Meat project has come in, which uh, the team today are going to tell you a little bit more about. Just to sum up that I said at the beginning about COVID and how that has really brought things to the fore. Um, the effects of COVID on wild meat are likely to be incredibly complicated and I'm not going to take you through this very detailed diagram. The point of the diagram really is that local level behaviour by hunters and by consumers is affected by um, all sorts of different drivers, all the way from international to national to local, and uh, affecting urban incomes, urban employment, affecting national governments, and so on. So there's huge complexity in how wild meat is actually likely to be affected by a thing like COVID. And if we think about um, what I've just been talking about in terms of demand consumption, there's suggestions that there might be national level changes in terms of marginalization of wild meat, whether that's because of people fearing it or because of more regulations coming in because of campaigns. It's also likely to be changes in food prices that would might shift people onto or off wild meat. And then there, there's likely to be all sorts of ambiguous changes in demand as a result. And the projects that, um, that Tibor is going to present later is gonna try and unpick some of those complexities because at the moment it's very unclear. So my concluding thoughts are, first of all, that uh, the very first slide, these calls for bans of wildlife consumption cannot ignore the realities of those who depend on it for food and wild and livelihoods. Secondly, this scaling point that I think we really need to focus on, that addressing household level consumption of meat in rural areas will not lead to the system-wide changes we need for wildlife recovery. We need to think about urban demand, we need to think about national level drivers, other drivers of wild meat consumption. I want to highlight that international illegal wildlife trade is multifaceted as well, and is mostly actually unconnected to this issue. And I think, therefore, that we need to shift from scapegoating towards rights-based approaches. I'm really looking to hearing, forward to hearing what everyone else has to say. Um, and yeah, I hope that gave you a little bit of context. Thanks very much, EJ. That was the perfect scene setter for the rest of the discussions today. So that was that was really great. Um, and I think really summarizes very clearly how complex this issue is and how simple solutions, whether they are sort of simple, but mis you know, well-intentioned but misguided alternative projects or well-intentioned but misguided campaigns to just ban everything are, are, are just not responding to the complexity of the issue. So this was one of the reasons why we launched our project was to really dig down and understand why do people eat choose to eat wild meat, focusing on rural Cameroon as a detailed case study, because there's no point in designing a wild meat alternative project um, if your, your, your project is replacing um, a food source, but actually people aren't eating wild meat because they need it for food, they're eating it because they like that specific taste or the cultural association. So you really have to understand exactly what it is about wild meat and about different species that drives people to hunt and consume them in order to then design a project that can seek to try and replace that behaviour if that is necessary. So I'm going to hand over to Dr Steph Britton, who was the lead researcher on our project. She's a postdoc researcher at ICCS, so working closely with EJ. She's going to be talking twice today, um, addressing two different sort of key research questions that our project posed, but starting off 
with really um, giving us deep insights into what are the drivers of wild meat consumption um, in rural Cameroon. Hi everybody, um, nice to see you all here. I'm uh, really, really looking forward to sharing our results of our work with you all today. So in response to conservation and food security concerns, conservation organizations often support initiatives that aim to curb the reliance on wild meat for both food and income. And this is particularly the case when meat comes from endangered species. So in many rural areas, wild meat is a key source of protein in people's diets. So if consumption of it is reduced, then alternative proteins must be available, acceptable and affordable. However, there is limited evidence, sorry, that um, alternative meat projects achieve their conservation and food security objectives. Um, further, the assumptions underpinning projects may be incorrect, such as the underlying reasons that drive people to eat wild meats, for example. So if these reasons aren't considered in the design of alternatives projects, the project may then fail to compensate for the key drivers of wild meat consumption. Next slide, please. So previous research in the Amazon suggested that in urban areas, human beliefs, attitudes and social norms can actually better predict consumption and preference than economic factors, which are usually considered to be a primary reason for consumption. But see if the case may be true in sub-Saharan Africa, Francesca Booker at IAED conducted a rapid review of the literature to explore the existing evidence of the drivers of wild meat as a food choice. So she included any peer-reviewed or gray literature that described or assessed the drivers of wild meat hunting and consumption as they relate to people's food choices. And so the results indicated that there's a large body of literature on wild meat hunting and consumption, but there's actually very little that deals with specifically the drivers of wild meat as a food choice, both in rural and in urban areas. Of the literature that did discuss the issue, very few studies specifically evaluated those drivers. So for example, of the 26 papers that she identified that noted taste as a driver of food choice, only six really provided any detailed insights into that. So drivers are often mentioned in passing, but the actual causal factors aren't really properly evaluated. Um, consumption was primarily linked with availability and affordability, um, while possible health benefits and cultural motivations for consumption were viewed as secondary drivers. But again, this is without really explicitly testing whether this was the case or not. So as such, they concluded that more research was required to investigate exactly why people choose to eat wild meat, um, and this is especially important if effective response strategies are going to be put into place. Next slide, please, Juliet. So as such, we conducted field work from April to June 2019 to assess the drivers of wild meat consumption and preferences in four villages around the Jar Reserve in Cameroon. So just a quick bit of background on these villages. So villages one and two, so the ones to the south and to the east, they're currently not involved in any formal alternatives projects. Uh, village one is the most remote village. Village two is located straight on a main well-used road that kind of connects the uh, capital Yaoundé with the Eastern region. Um, so they have good connections to markets and people pass by frequently there. Um, villages three and four to the north are actively involved in alternatives projects uh, that promote fishing and cocoa production. And they're also located more closely to um, a park kind of law enforcement base. Um, in particular compared to the other villages. So we aim to understand the importance of wild meat in people's lives, explore people's food choices and explore variation in the drivers and barriers shaping those choices. We interviewed 542 people from 177 households um, using semi-structured interviews. Uh, people were just asked how frequently they ate wild meat, um, whether alternatives were also deemed available and if so, when. Um, when we also use an approach called free listing to explore what the preferred and avoided species of wild meat were. So a free list basically involves listing anything in a given category. So for example, species you prefer to eat or species you avoid eating um, in whatever order they come to mind. And then the resulting list reflects local preferences um, and also variation within and between the study villages. And we followed up um, that free listing exercise with open-ended questions to learn why each of those species was cited by the respondent. Next slide, please. So people in village one were significantly more likely to eat meat more regularly than people in villages two to four. So again, village one is the most remote village. Perhaps this is because wild meat is more available here, or perhaps they depend on it more for food security than the other less remote villages um, where accessing alternatives might be more straightforward. 
And we found that older participants ate wild meat less regularly than younger participants. And we also found that men were more likely to eat wild meat more regularly than women. Um, farmers, and in particular fishermen, were less likely to consume wild meat um, as regularly as hunters, which probably doesn't come as a huge surprise. Um, regardless of their involvement in um, wild meat alternative projects, all four of the villages reported the presence of alternatives to wild meat. So alternatives commonly cited included eggs, chicken, fish, but overwhelmingly fish was the most prominent option and actually the only alternative cited across all the four villages. Um, but again, in all the four villages, um, alternatives were only seasonally available. Um, village two was the exception here. So most people here uh, said that alternatives were available all year round. Um, it's the best connected village, as I said before, it's located on a well-used road and people here are better able to access alternatives all year round from markets and passers by. So as such, village location in relation to roads and markets may well influence the availability of alternatives and also people's ability to ensure their food security throughout the year. Next slide, please. So having explored how often wild meat is consumed by different groups, we wanted to learn which animals were preferred for consumption and which were avoided where possible. So this graph shows the species that were cited as preferred and avoided by more than 10% of respondents and the reasons provided for preferring or avoiding them. So what we found was that across all species, the most popular species were brush-tailed porcupine and blue diker. And this is followed by pangolin species. So this is the white-bellied and black-bellied pangolin grouped together. Um, fish was the most popular non-wild meat option in all villages above any other domestic animal. Um, gorilla and chimpanzee were most avoided, followed by leopard, tortoise, and black colobus. Um, so we wanted to know why people prefer and avoid the species cited. Um, and the reasons for species preference and avoidance uh, were actually quite relative, were relatively consistent, sorry, across all the species. But um, there were species level differences in the importance of each um, reason. So looking at the graph on the left, so taste in red, was markedly the top reason for liking brush-tailed porcupine and pangolin species, um, while perceived health benefits in green was the most commonly cited reason for preferring fish, but it was also mentioned as a reason for preferring um, porcupine, blue diker, and pangolin. So these white meat species um, were perceived to be lighter on the stomach and potentially better for the gut than other dark meat species. Um, older participants also cited that uh, they preferred these animals because they were softer meats and easier uh, to eat when they had dental problems, which actually came up quite a few times. Um, so ease of access in blue was the most commonly cited reason for preferring blue diker. Um, and that suggests that food sources that require less effort to hunt are, are quite desirable. So fish were also considered to be easy to access by 25% of respondents. However, again, with seasonal variation in their availability. So although not a major driver of preference, tradition in purple, and we're looking on the right-hand side now. Um, so tradition was cited by at least 25% of the participants as a reason for avoiding um, a given species. Uh, and this was the main reason for avoiding black colobus, leopard, tortoise, and dwarf antelope. Um, taste in red was also consistently cited as a reason for avoiding species, um, in particular for large diker species. And an off-putting appearance in blue was cited by more than 25% of participants as a reason for avoiding gorilla and chimpanzee. And participants actually frequently shared that um, the fact that they look too much like humans really put them off eating them. So we found significant village level differences as well in the reasons for avoidance, but not so much in the in preference. So people in village three, one of the villages to the north involved in alternative projects. So they were more likely to cite the existence of law or a fear of penalties as a reason for avoiding species, um, possibly because of their involvement in education and awareness activities linked to wild meat alternative present, um, projects in their village. Um, in contrast, the law wasn't mentioned once as a barrier to consumption in village one, which is the most remote village to the south. So here people were more likely to cite tradition, a bad taste and health concerns as key barriers. We also found significant individual level differences in the reasons for avoidance. So, for example, men were significantly less likely than women to cite a lack of access. Um, but were more likely to sell to cite um, issues like health or the legal status of the species. Okay, next slide, please. 
So in summary, we found that um, while taste was found to be a significant factor in the consumption of wild meats in urban contexts, the IIED review um, found that the literature often linked wild meat demand to availability and affordability in rural settings. But our research found that taste was actually a primary driver of wild meat preference in all four of these rural villages. So our findings challenge this common narrative that taste is viewed as a secondary driver in rural areas. And this has important implications for the design of future alternatives projects. So in this area, alternatives in the future would need to taste really good. Um, furthermore, financial factors were not even mentioned as a reason for consuming or avoiding wild meat. And the finding that wealth is not a major driver of consumption in this area may be supported again by the overall preference for quite easily accessible, non-protected species across all villages like porcupine and budaika. And that's obviously with the exception of pangolins. So in the jar reserve, future alternatives should be easy to access, they should taste good, and they should ideally be perceived as healthy. Um, because fish was viewed as a healthy and preferred meat, alternative projects offering fish might be a viable option in the study area. Although again, the seasonality of availability must be considered. And importantly for project glo uh, designers globally, um, the drivers of wild meat choice are context specific. And so responses need to be equally specific. So in our example, uh, village level differences in the availability of wild meats and the availability of alternatives as well as access to roads and markets may affect both the need and the willingness of people to participate in alternative projects. So project designers should try to consider the role that um, gender, tradition, and um, possibly ethnicity, for example, may play in dictating what people can and cannot eat. So again, these factors may not be the same everywhere in the world, but it's important that the drivers of consumption, whatever they may be, are investigated before starting any project. So these results were used to guide the design of the next phase of our research, which I'll be talking to you about later on, and that's to explore what types of alternatives people would like and the characteristics of a successful wild meat alternative project. So thank you. Many thanks, Steph, for those um, insights into the, the drivers of wild meat consumption. And before we move on to the second part of the research, which then responds to that and looks at the design of alternatives, Along came COVID, and we wondered whether that would affect any of these drivers or make a difference to wild meat consumption. So Thibaut, um, our colleague from Cameroon, is going to present the research findings um, from our rapid response study that looked into this. So Cedric Thibaut is a researcher with FCTV in Cameroon, and he led this part of the project. So Thibaut, over to you. Okay, thanks, Lee. Um, I'm going to talk about the study that we carried out as part of the Why Eat White Meat project, and which focuses on the impact of the COVID 19 pandemic on white meat use and perception in communities surrounding the Japan Reserve, that is the GFR in Cameroon. Okay, here's the context and objectives of the study. Uh, as you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused major damage to health conditions and the way of life of population around the world. While the source of the COVID-19 outbreak is still unknown, one hypothesis is that the virus could have originated or have an intermediary host in white life. White meat is used for by rural communities around the world as an important source of food and income. It can be expected that COVID-19 has altered the perception of white meat as a food source among rural consumers as a result of the emergence of the disease. So this study aimed to understand how COVID-19 has impacted perceptions, choices, and consumption, as well as traits of white meat in Cameroon. We carried out our, our research from February 27 to March 19, 2021. Regarding the method, we opted for a semi-structured interview based, based on a questionnaire recorded in the tablet, that is in the Kobo Collect form. The participants were at least 18 years old. Before the start of the interviews, we first obtained their free prior and informed consent, and we informed them of the possibility to stop or withdraw at any time. The team was made up of Salihou, is on the picture, and myself I was the one taking the picture. Also, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, 
the interviews were carried out in compliance with barrier measures. Interviewees were also sensitized about how to prevent the spread of COVID-19. And we were giving them soaps and hand sanitizer to help them face the pandemic. Concerning the, the study villages, the research was carried out in 20 villages around the GFR, seven villages in the East Antenna and 11 villages in the North Antenna. GFR is the Jafunal Reserve. Apart from their geographical location, the two antenna differ mainly in terms of development. Indeed, the east antenna of the GFR is more developed than the north antenna, due in particular to the logging operations that are installed there. This creates additional opportunities for the locals, and the economic development of the region is also an attraction for poachers. In terms of results obtained, here we have in the table the impacts of the government response to COVID-19 on livelihoods in the eastern and northern antenna villages. In this table, we can see that in the two antenna, the social economic impacts of the pandemic are very numerous and affect very important aspects of the life of these populations. In the graph, we have the frequency of white meat consumption by respondents in eastern and northern antenna villages. As we can see, the consumption of bush meat has remained frequent among populations around the GFR, with the peak at the level of weekly consumption. We also realize that the weekly and daily consumption peaks are higher in the east antenna than in the north antenna. This suggests that the consumption of white meat is more frequent among the population of the east antenna than among the population of the north antenna. This may be explained by the greater economic development in the East Antenna than in the North Antenna, with inhabitants having more money to buy meat and poacher who are also more frequent. Also, we can think of the sensitization sessions carried out in the two zones by various organizations. We do not have the same impact, the population of the North Antenna being closer and giving even eventually more confidence to the NGOs present in the zone. Here, we have the, in, in the first graph, the proportion of respondents in the eastern and northern antenna one, who identified different types of meat as transmitting disease. As we can see, this population believe that white meat is the one presenting the most risk of disease transmission. And yet, the consumption of white meat remains very important. I have even have received stories from hunters saying that they sometimes collect animals that have already died in the forest and come to sell them in the villages, even though they are aware of the risk of disease. In the second graph, we have diseases that the population in the eastern and northern antenna villages reported as being transmitted from white meat. As we can see, they cited a wide range of diseases, but that do not prevent people from regularly consuming white meat. So these two results show, once again, the importance of white meat for this population, who despite being aware of the risk of transmission, continue to regularly consume white meat. To finish, we have here the respondent where we have respondent where and ask whether they agreed or disagreed with the idea of white meat markets closures in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. In the two until now, we have as a result 73% that disagreed, 90% that agreed, and 8% that neither agreed nor disagreed. Here are some few sentences that they said. If we close bush meat market, how will we do? Before closing Bushmi markets, alternatives should be implemented. So as a conclusion, you can say that white meat takes a prominent place among the population around the GFR, who continue to depend on it as a source of income and protein, despite the possible risk of transmission. This study has helped us to reveal the extent of the socioeconomic impact and also the cultural impact of the pandemic. Moreover, for population around the GFR, 
this impact seems more worrying than the health risk posed by the disease itself. Our findings will help inform decision making and guide initiatives to mitigate the impacts of the pandemic around the GFR and elsewhere in rural area. Actually, actually, we are writing a paper. Thank you for your kind attention and to the whole project team. Thank you very much indeed, Thibaut. So some interesting insights there into the um, impact on the ground of, of COVID-19 um, around the jar. So reflecting on the drivers of wild meat consumption, Steph's now going to present the second half of our research, which was to then look at what kind of alternative uh, projects might work and, and might work better than existing ones. So Steph, back to you. Hi, everybody. Hi again. Uh, fantastic talk, Tibo. Thank you very much. Um, so wild meat interventions are often uh, difficult to implement. Um, the project design and implementation is costly and takes a long time. As such, to avoiding wasting resources and also to build up false expectations, it's a good idea, if possible, to try and explore um, what the response to an intervention could be before starting the project. So scenarios-based interviews are an approach that are used in many different fields to predict a future response of people who may be targeted by a specific intervention. So discussing the, fu the future sorry, um, provides valuable insight into not only um, how people are likely to respond um, to the different scenarios presented, but also the reasons why they may respond that way. Next slide, please. So we carried out our research um, from June to September, so straight after the first phase, in the same four villages as the first phase of the research on food preferences. Uh, we used uh, scenario-based interviewing to understand locally desired features of wild meat alternative projects and to provide evidence of responses um, to a range of possible wild meat interventions prior to their implementation. Uh, we asked participants to think about how each scenario could work with them and their household, given their current time constraints and other household or livelihood responsibilities, and whether the scenario would actually result in a reduction in hunting um, or consumption of wild meats in the household. So we carried out 171 interviews and that represented one person per, per participating household. Um, next slide, please. So to give you a quick recap on how the first phase of the research informed the design of these scenarios for the next phase. So our previous research showed um, that alternatives in the jar should be tasty, healthy, and easy to access, um, or easier to manage, I should say, than wild meat, alternative, than wild meat hunting. Um, fish was the fourth um, most preferred meat and the only non-wild meat option cited by more than 10% of those surveyed. So, as such, we first asked people to consider how hunting consumption in their household may change over the next five years if their current situation didn't change. So that was the baseline. Um, we then offered six different scenarios. So we offered three different fish rearing and three chicken farming projects at different scales. Um, so these were offered. So keeping fish ponds and chicken coops would ensure that the meat is easy to access and would provide meat all year round. So that would be dealing with the seasonality and access issues that were previously raised in the first phase of our research. Uh, chicken was used as a comparison to fish because it was actually the top uh, domestic, uh, the top preferred domestic meats in the previous research, although admittedly not seen as tasty as, as fish. Um, chicken is also often cited as a possible alternative in projects across sub-Saharan Africa, so we wanted to see what people's reactions might be to such a project. So aside from comparing fish and chicken farming projects, uh, we also compared projects that offer subsistence only and those that were able to also provide um, income at the household level. So recognising that hunting for food and income is often blurred, we wondered if people may prefer a smaller scale, lower effort subsistence only project or one that would provide that would require more effort from the household, but that would result in income generation as well. Finally, we compared household versus community scale projects. So because projects are frequently offered at a, um, a community or larger group level, we wanted to see how people would respond to sharing the work burden, but also making shared decisions about any project benefits. 
So after hearing each scenario, respondents were asked what they thought of the project, whether they would like to be involved in such a project hypothetically, and how they thought that that project may affect their household hunting and consumption of wild meat over the next five years. Um, we then discussed why they thought that way, and we delved into the perceived individual and household barriers to participation, their motivation to participate, and whether the project would be able to run sustainably after the five years of hypothetical project support was over. Next slide, please. So this graph shows how likely a reduction in hunting consumption is compared to the baseline. So what we found is that projects that offer food and income resulted in the greatest predicted decline in hunting consumption. So households are more than 20 times more likely to reduce their hunting consumption under scenario four, which is fish for food and income, and more than 10 times more likely to reduce their consumption hunting under scenario five, so that was chicken for food and income, than under the current uh, business, business as usual baseline scenario. However, the predicted reduction of both hunting consumption with fish or chicken farming was conditional on the projects being offered at the household rather than the community scale. So the community-wide projects, so their projects six and seven to the right of the graph, uh, barely reduced hunting household or consumption compared to the baseline. So perceived um, community level pro uh, conflicts, um, poor benefit sharing among community members um, in favor of those in elite positions um, were issues that were commonly cited as to why community levels would not be successful in these villages. Um, the project offering fish farming for food and income was half as likely to reduce both hunting consumption compared to, sorry, the project offering chicken was half as likely uh, to reduce hunting consumption compared to the fish farming for food and income. Um, so this was quite interesting. Respondents in all villages said that despite liking the taste of chicken, they would find it hard to imagine eating it on a regular basis. Um, they said that chicken is usually reserved for special occasions or is seen as a resource to be used in times of financial need. Um, next slide, please. So to wrap up, in our study area, we found that projects offering food and income resulted in much better predicted reduction in household hunting and consumption. Um, we found that projects at the household level perform much better than community projects, uh, which actually resulted in almost no change in hunting and consumption compared to the baseline. Um, so as such, it's really important that project implementers uh, consider the impact that possible power dynamics or elite capture or even mistrust may have on the long-term success of a project from the very start. Um, however, if properly addressed, community projects may still work in some cases around the jar, um, because many people actually in our study site said that if these issues were resolved, um, they'd be willing to try and participate in, in community scale projects. Next slide, please. So EJ already mentioned the um, work by Wakanda and Code, and they estimated that uh, livelihoods projects included in a literature review amounted to about $2.2 million a year. And again, none of which has a real demonstrated conservation impact. So if that is the case for wild meat alternative projects, um, this potentially represents a massive waste of financial resources and also a failure both for the biodiversity that these projects are meant to safeguard but also for the people who expect their livelihoods and food security to improve um, as a result of participation in these initiatives. So we really must do better to try and consider rural people's food security and their preferences if we're to design acceptable alternatives that achieve both their social and conservation goals. So what we've done is we've drawn together our learnings from this project and our experiences in Cameroon um, to create some new practical guidance for those who are designing and implementing projects to reduce the consumption of wild meat in rural communities. And what we suggest is that project implementers pay more attention um, to the early stages of project design to properly explore and account for local food preferences, um, the drivers of consumption and the characteristics of a successful project that results in the greatest reduction in hunting or consumption. The drivers identified in our study won't be the same everywhere else. But the need to understand these drivers through proper engagement with communities um, from the very beginning is a key global need. So in five steps, the guidance explains how practitioners can help to develop the right project for the community in which they're working and support communities to develop their own sustainable initiatives, alternatives, initiatives. Um, each stage provides uh, the reader with a kind of like a checklist of considerations to account for before moving on to the next step. 
and also recognizing that the capacity for in-depth social research varies um, between different institutions. We provide guidance for carrying out social research, um, including several example surveys and templates. Um, the guidance is currently available in English and in French. Uh, the Spanish and Portuguese translations are well underway and will soon be available to download from the IIED project page. So if you are a practitioner involved in the design of alternatives projects, then we really urge you to look at the guidance and use it for your own work. Um, we're also currently looking for people who are soon to be involved in the design of an alternative project to trial the use of this guidance in real life. So if that's you, or if you know of someone uh, or a project who may be interested, then please do let me know. Um, next slide, please. I think that should be it. So yeah, a few links have been shared in the chat. Um, so I think we've got links to the guidance, both in English and French, as I said, but there's also hopefully a couple of links to the online surveys. Um, so if you are a practitioner involved in the design of alternatives or a conservation policy maker, we'd really appreciate 10 minutes of your time to fill in um, these surveys that are looking to explore the kind of the factors of successful project design um, and uh, the kind of uh, factors that um, you've identified as being important to predict um, wild meat consumption and preference. Um, and also, if you have looked at the decision support tool guidance, uh, or if you plan to, and if you have any feedback for us at all, then we would very, very much appreciate you uh, getting in contact as well. So thank you for listening, and thank you to the White Wild Meat team for the hard work that's gone into this research and into developing the guidance. Thank you very much, Steph. That was great. And as Steph said, we really, really want to get feedback um, both on the tool, but also on wider issues around wild meat through those surveys that um, we've put the links in the chat to. So we'd be really, really grateful for your responses to those. It would really help us um, uh, going forward. So thanks very much in advance if, if you're able to, to fill out those forms. Okay, our last uh, panelist um, is Jasmine Willis. Um, Jasmine is a research fellow with uh, C4 and also a visiting fellow at ICCS and carrying on the theme of actually thinking about wild meat interventions, Jasmine's going to introduce us to a new database. So thank you very much and over to you, Jasmine. Thank you. Okay. So yep, hi, my name is Jasmine. Um, I'm going to be talking about the Wild Meat Interventions database um, that I've been working on at the moment. So first of all, I'll just give you a quick overview of the Wild Meat project more generally. Um, so it's a collaboration between C4, the University of Stirling and the Wildlife Conservation uh, Society. Um, and the aim of the project is to make the best information on wild meat available to anyone working on the topic. Um, so we're creating three different tools to help do this. Um, so the wild meat database um, will contain information on wild meat hunting, consumption and trade worldwide. And then the wild meat library um, will contain up to date research on wild meat and the Wild Meat Toolkit, which will contain standardized research methods and templates to monitor wild meat hunting, consumption and trade. And today I'm going to talk about a secondary database that we created, um, which contains projects that implement wild meat interventions. So similar to the Wild Meat database more broadly, um, this database aims to provide those working in wild meat with the best available evidence to design effective management interventions. So we selected projects that aim to manage or reduce wild meat use and consumption and trade at a specific site. And so far we've started with projects based in Central Africa that were active between 2000 and the start of this year. But we do have plans to expand this to other locations in the future as well. So at the moment, the interventions database includes five different intervention types. Um, so alternative livelihood, including protein and income, law enforcement, hunting management, awareness raising activities and demand reduction campaigns. 
And here you can see the structure of the database. Um, so projects with multiple locations were split so that each location is a separate project with an overarching parent project. Um, and projects can consist of multiple interventions and an intervention is one component of a project that implements a certain activity. So for instance, one of the five intervention types here. So as of July this year, the interventions database includes 285 projects from 10 different countries implemented by 225 organizations and funded by 116 donors. And from looking at the database, we can see that a wide range of projects have been used to help manage wild meat in Central Africa. Um, and figure one shows the distribution of the projects um, across those 10 Central African countries. Uh, so you can see that the projects are kind of concentrated in um, a, a, just a few different countries. So Cameroon had the highest number of projects, which was um, 82. The DRC had 69 and then the RSC had 67. And only four projects were identified in Burundi and only one in Chad. Although it should be noted that um, this isn't necessarily a definitive list, it's just the projects that we identified whilst we compiled the database. So this slide um, just shows a breakdown of the top donors and implementing organizations of the projects that are currently in the database. So um, in terms of donors, the US Fish and Wildlife Service was the um, donor for the most projects, which was 92, um, followed by the Rufford Foundation with 42. And then in terms of the implementing organizations, these were mostly major international NGOs. Um, so for instance, the Wildlife Conservation Society um, with 54 projects and WWF with 26 projects. And this slide shows a breakdown by intervention type. So over half of the projects implemented alternative livelihood interventions. Uh, so this was the most used inter intervention of the five. Um, in figure four, you can see that um, alternative livelihoods are split into alternative income and alternative protein. And we found that animal farming was the most frequently used alternative income and protein. Uh, then there were 136 awareness raising interventions in the database, um, and you can see by looking at figure five, um, which shows the number of interventions by year, um, the awareness raising interventions um, kind of consistently has risen since um, 2000. And there's also been a consistently increasing number of law enforcement interventions as well, which is the green line. Um, in contrast, there were only 10 demand reduction campaigns in the database that we found. Um, although if you look at figure five, you can see that around 2010, the number of um, demand reduction campaigns has increased, uh, which we found coincided with an increased focus on reducing demand for wild meat, particularly in urban consumers. Um, so we've created an online platform for users to be able to explore the database. It's not yet live, but I'm going to give you a quick preview of the platform. So you should be able to see it here. Sorry, I think there's a bit of a glitch there. But you should be able to see it um, reasonably clearly. Um, so there's a map showing um, the project location. So these are the 285 projects that I mentioned before. Um, you can either click on an icon and view information about that particular project. Um, you've got the project aims. Uh, you can see the start date, the website, uh, the type of project intervention um, they implemented. And then there's also some references if you want to find out a bit more information. And if I just go back to the main page, um, you can see that uh, there's a list of the projects on the left hand side as well. Um, so you can also navigate through the projects that way. And you can also filter the projects by country, start date, type of intervention used um, and country as well. Uh, 
And there's also a series of figures here which give you a few insights into the database. So most of these are ones that I already showed. You could see the top donors, the top implementers, um, and the projects by start date as well. You can also download the original data here, um, and you can also find out a bit more information about the partners, and um, there's some information about the interventions database here as well, um, including some definitions of the five different intervention types that we used. Um, and there's a bit of information at the end about what we'll be doing next. So just going back to the slideshow. Um, so next steps, the intervention database as it is at the moment collects current knowledge on different approaches to managing wild meat, but we also do want to um, provide inform information on the effectiveness of the interventions that are in the database. Um, and this has been mentioned a few times, but uh, it's been quite difficult for us to determine the effectiveness um, of these interventions. A lot of the projects were small scale projects with really limited funding. And firstly, they're not always published. The details aren't always published. And secondly, very few of them monitored uh, and evaluated their outcomes. So it's difficult for us to determine the effectiveness of the projects based on just the information that we found. So as a result, um, this year, we're going to be interviewing a number of project implementers, donors, and participants to find out a bit more information on their project outcomes. And we'll hopefully make this information available next year as part of the interventions database. So you can support our work by giving us feedback on the intervention database um, and the online platform that I showed you today and letting us know of any additional projects that could be added to the database. So you can either email us at our info at email or contact me directly, or um, you can visit our website for more information. Thank you. Thanks very much, Yasmin. Okay, great. We have got 15 minutes now uh, for a Q&A session with the panellists. There's some questions in the, uh, the Q&A function and also a few from the chat that I'm going to bring through. So the first one, and actually this is a sort of a more generic one, and I wondered whether I might direct this to you first, EJ. Um, it's it's by from Mark Day about why um, freshwater species seem to appear relatively infrequently in wild meat research, given that many communities will consume amphibians, crustaceans, mollusks, etc. Th these are generally excluded. And is there any real reason for that that you're aware of? Hi, I think that's a really good question. Um, so I guess there has been a tradition of people thinking a little bit more mannerly um, but uh, often these freshwater species sneak into our databases because they are being sold. So crocs, for example, quite often appear in databases. Um, a brilliant PhD student from the University of Ghana called Hannah Saki has just done an amazing PhD in which she found in northern Ghana there's huge sales of frogs going on that really are not noticed. Um, and that's mostly for local consumption. And then the mammal species that she found in her bushmeat markets were the ones that were being exported to urban markets in Ghana and further afield. So maybe if you look at urban markets, you might get less of this freshwater stuff that's more subsistence based. But I do think that for a kind of freshwater bushmeat is, if that's not a word, a, a kind of contradiction in terms, freshwater bushmeat would be really useful for people to think more about and research more as Hanasaki has done. And secondly, um, I think fish itself, and there were other questions about that, fish itself as an alternative protein source and as something that is potentially unsustainably um, exploited also needs more attention in these, in these um, study areas. Completely agree. Great, thanks, thanks very much, EJ. And um, actually, just on the subject of fish, and perhaps I'll go to you with this, Steph. There were a couple of questions about fish. So one asking, how are fresh fish harvested um, in the area if they are very popular? And is aquaculture common? Um, yes. So in the area that 
uh, we worked in, so around the jar, obviously there's the, the jar river. So there's a few different types of fishing. Um, so river fishing um, in the jar river is a seasonal activity and it's predominantly done by men um, uh, who go out in the dry season. In the wet season, it's too dangerous. So people don't fish in the jar river during the rainy season. Um, not very much at all, um, which is why um, the availability of fish is seen as a seasonal kind of seasonally available. Um, women also do barrier fishing, which does um, happen all year round. But um, while it's available, it's not really seen as like a primary source of protein throughout the year. Um, the other question was whether or not agriculture is carried out. Yes. So in the villages that I've been working in, again, hasn't been done. Um, but the idea of uh, agriculture was seen by people in the villages as a good way to get around the seasonality issue and the availability of, of fish uh, throughout certain times of year. But um, I know that FCTV have been working in certain villages not far away where agriculture is, is carried out. So, um, yeah, I think they might be able to provide you with a bit more information on that if you wanted more on that. But, yeah, it is a popular option often. Thank you. And then um, for you, Thibaut, um, a couple of questions. Somebody asked, uh, Cecile Sarabain asked, if people, the people that you spoke to that mentioned they were concerned about disease and getting food poisoning and so on from wild meat, did that actually stop them eating it? Did it prevent them from eating it ever again? Or was it just something that they accepted as a risk and put up with? The couple of, the couple of, of meat that can cause uh, stomach ache or poisoning, like what they call here, beef. And what the thing is that even though they know this meat has warm, talking about warm, the thing, cooking the meat well will prevent the man eating it to, to get the disease. So even if they know the worm is present in the meat, they, they, they continue to eat it. And I think it's also because it's like important for them to, to eat the, the meat. They don't have a lot of alternatives. So when they get the meat, they, 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 they cook it well and they believe it can prevent them to, from having the disease. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and one other for you, um, we're in the findings of the um, research on the impacts of COVID found no real um, overarching patterns of change in consumption. But it's been pointed out that um, with the Ebola outbreak, that really did have at least a temporary effect on wild meat consumption. So what do you think the difference is? Is it, is it because people are just not making the connection between COVID-19 and wild meat and that they're thinking that it's it's so uncertain what the causes are, or is there another reason? Okay. What I can say is that even when they, they are certain of the link between, even when they are, they, they are sure that the thing, there's a link between the disease and eating the meat, as far as they don't see someone around them having the disease, they still they continue to believe that the disease is what they say down people is for down people or even people from abroad european chinese that's what they think i think that is because they have not seen someone having the disease locally some even think the disease was created for them not to eat white meat because they, are, they have never seen someone having the disease. So I, can, I think it can explain. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, and then I've got a question here from um, James Mayers. Steph, I'll, I'll direct this to you first, but Thibaut, you might want to chip in here. So just wondering whether it came up in the research, whether um, there were any, whether people talked at all about um, the process of change and rapid change quite often in the jar. So increasing market access, increasing logging and infrastructure projects and so on, and whether that, that kind of development was having any impact on preferences for wild meat consumption um, or, or sales. Steph, any insights into that? Yeah, I mean, I can talk about um, kind of 
what I've perceived and what I've heard from people who live in these areas. So, as I said at the beginning, so village one, which is to the south, it, it was a quite a remote village. There's, it's not very well connected at all. Um, and it, it stands in quite contrast to village uh, two, which is again, right on a main road, uh, surrounded by timber concessions. There's a, a timber concession base, just not far up the road. Lots of people coming into the area, lots of um, kind of uh, infrastructure and, and kind of development and yeah, lots of activity going on there. Um, so in particular in village two, for example, um, people talked a lot about um, how hunting is becoming hard work, how people are having to put in a lot more effort to go hunting to catch even porcupines, you know, things that they use as a they're kind of like standard bread and butter food in the area. Um, and I think in village one, if I remember right, it, it's, that's those kind of changes aren't quite there yet, but they are starting to potentially happen. Um, so what we found as well with the actual preferences was things like um, uh, taboos and um, the drivers that aren't so much associated with the law, with NGO involvement, um, uh, were less of an issue or were less prevalent, sorry, in village one, which was more remote, whereas in the other villages that are much more connected, um, uh, those kind of uh, drivers or like barriers to consumption were mentioned a lot more. Um, but yeah, I mean, more broadly, I think that issues around kind of land use change and the kind of pressures that people in the communities themselves are facing in terms of being able to actually access meat in the first place are massively different in certain parts where um, infrastructure and logging and things like that are happening because um, the space that people have to hunt is is getting squashed basically and um, I think that that is certainly a challenge in, in some parts of the jar and I hope that we wouldn't see the same thing happening um, in the south of the jar where village one is located. Thanks uh, Tibo. I don't know whether you want to add anything to that um, based on your wider research around the jar, the impacts of sort of infrastructure development, logging and so on? Oh, I, I think they've said, said everything. When, they are, when the villages are close to the road, when there's logging operations around there, they, they, are, they are closer to, to customers. And the, 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 the amount of hunting is directly linked to the amount of customers that they have, they have access to. So. Okay, great, thank you. And then this one is, is related. Um, it, it's not something that we discussed or, or addressed in our Why Eat Wild Meat project because we focused on rural consumption. But EJ, you might have a few, be able to shed some light on this from Trade Hub Research. Uh, David Wilkie is asking if anybody can shed light on the role that growing provincial towns and metropolitan areas are playing in wild meat consumption. Um, I don't know where I don't know whether that's something that's come up in trade and whether you can have some insights on that. I don't have any personal insights, but I do know that Kate Abernethy, for example, and Lauren Code are doing a lot of work on this. Maybe um, Julia would have something to say, actually. I, I, I can say, um, I mean, we, we've been working on changes in, um, in uh, small secondary towns and uh, consumption in urban areas and all that. And if the question is, um, is it growing? Yes, it is. I mean, and certainly in, we've uh, done quite a bit of work in West Africa at the moment that actually shows that um, certainly COVID is not necessarily having an impact um, on the consumption of wild meat in Freetown, for example. You know, it all depends in the area. But, but if you, if David is asking, is it a, a major problem in secondary towns? Yes, it is. If he is uh, concerned about the fact that these secondary towns should be supported with alternative meats, oh, as we have right. talked many, many a times, yes, of course, uh, because oh, these are the ones that are closest to the forest areas and demanding a lot of wild meat for them. So yeah, I don't know whether that answers it. Yeah. Great, thanks, Julia. And sorry to put you on the spot when you didn't even know you were on the panel. <laughs> That's great. I think we've got time for one more. And this is just something that came out of the chat. And it's sort of about 
a little bit about research methods. So again, probably going back to Steph and uh, Thibault, um, it's pointed out that um, stated preferences um, are not necessarily the same as observed preferences. So, um, you know, how much confidence do we have that people aren't necessarily telling researchers what they think they might want to hear? And another point was raised in the chat about um, the same with the impact of the law, where people are avoiding species, makers if they're concerned about legislation. Again, is that something that um, people are just saying because they obviously don't want to admit to eating species that are protected by law? Or is that something that um, the, the way of asking questions can, um, can, can account for? Okay, so yeah, a couple of things on that. So the way that we ask questions, as you, as you mentioned there, did help to account for that. So we weren't specifically asking about specific species. It was a case of free listing. So what are the species that you prefer and that you avoid? Um, so yeah, granted, people may think, oh, I don't want to mention that I prefer X, Y, Z species. I'm going to say I like porcupine and pangolin. But equally, then when it came to asking people why people prefer or avoid species, um, as I said, the law came up um, for some species, but not really for others. And you'd kind of think that, okay, if, if people are just telling me what they would like what they think I want to hear, they would be citing the law as a reason for avoiding all of these species. Um, and also people, the fact that people say that pangolin species globally were a hugely preferred species in terms of taste. As I said, um, blue diker and porcupine were the two top preferred species, but pangolin joint, um, white-bellied and black-bellied pangolin came in um, a close third. And people were just openly like, I love the taste. I mean, I've got a few quotes in my head from people, you know, when I asked, you know, why do you like it? And they said, they could, they spoke quite passionately about it, about the taste and how that there's no way on earth that there's any alternative project that could ever come along that would dissuade people from eating it because they love the taste so much. So I don't think that they would say things like that to me if they were just telling me what I thought, what they thought I wanted to hear. Great. Okay. Thanks so much, Steph. Um, we will have to leave it there for time reasons on the Q&A. There are some really great questions in the Q&A um, box that I'm afraid we haven't had time to get to. Um, if our panellists could try and type as many answers in as possible um, over the next 10, 15 minutes, that would be great while we move on to our two um, respondents. So um, I'd like to introduce now um, Julia Farr. Uh, Julia is a professor of natural science at Manchester Met University and also a C4 associate. Um, and is just going to reflect briefly on the um, research findings and specifically on the implications for the CBD guidelines for a sustainable wild meat sector. So, um, Julia, please. Yes, of course. Um, I mean, what I um, would like to do is uh, give you a little bit of a background of what happened uh, actually in December 2019 uh, when we presented the information uh, um, that we had got together with regards to um, generating a um, sustainable wild meat sector. And, and this was actually presented to the CBD, to the parties there. Um, it was um, a work that C4 led in fact by Lauren Kurd. Uh, we um, produced information that will allow the parties to be able to say yes to working towards sustainable uh, wild meat sector. Well, what that actually meant was that we wanted all of the parties to try to understand, first of all, what we meant by the wild meat um, over exploitation problem. And um, for them to realize that we were dealing with three main things. We were dealing with ecological impacts of wild meat um, hunting, of course, and the impact of removing animals of the seed dispersers, et cetera, et cetera, the functioning of ecosystems. We want them to understand the fundamental 
issue or the fundamental uh, value of wild meat in terms of food security and nutrition for millions of people all over the world. And also the issue of all the fact that there are health problems associated with certain types of manipulation of wild meat overall. We did um, this in, in two um, different stages. The first stage was to actually produce a document that the parties could have a look at and actually agree to, to sign. Uh, really what we wanted the parties to do was to be able to um, say, yes, we think this is a, a very important problem. Uh, it's an issue that we should all address worldwide. And then we would uh, provide them with uh, a technical document that would allow them to understand the problems further and perhaps even go towards doing things that like we are talking about here. Again, the question of sustainable hunting is still a major issue, not just in terms of implementing it, but also understanding it in many ways. So there was a tremendous amount of discussion in Montreal in December 2019 about these issues. What was very clear as well was that we do have certain differences um, that are actually marked by continents in terms of what the main issues towards wild meat hunting and unsustainable hunting is all about. And what I mean to say is that the Latin Americans have a very different view to what is happening in Africa. And that was very, very clear in, in the discussions we had in Montreal. You know, people were, in fact, I was in the situation in which I had to, uh, in a way, intervene and trying to calm the waters because certain countries in Latin America were thinking that we were putting them all in the same basket and really uh, you've got to deal with the Amazon, for example, differently to how you deal with the Congo Basin. I don't know whether that, that, that gives you a background of that. I think we have a very solid document um, and the technical document, in fact, is now available to download from the C4 website. But, um, you know, certainly all merits to my great colleague, Lauren, and a huge team of people that actually um, put together all that information to try to make a difference worldwide. Let's hope that we can follow this up. Thank you very much, Julia. And, and as we're finding with the decision support tool as well, the Latin American context is different to the African context. And so, as you know, we have some work to do to massage that, to make that something that is more internationally applicable rather than just uh, just focused on Africa. Okay. Great, thank you very much. Um, and I'll just turn to our um, second respondent, um, Andrew Fowler. Uh, Andrew's the regional lead for Western Central Africa with the Zoological Society of London and um, involved in many um, wild meat alternative projects. And Andrew, it would be good to get your reflections um, on the research, but also quite specifically, if possible, on the tool that we've produced yes. and its likely um, applicability to the kinds of projects that you're involved in designing and implementing. Yeah, thanks very much. So um, just a bit of background. Zillatel has been heavily involved in Cameroon for over a decade um, in two main landscapes, the, the Jar Trident landscape and Dweller Adea, and in that time, um, led by Fanny Junkum, our community coordinator, and um, Amandine Kumbu. Um, we've engaged a lot of community projects, um, including income generating projects, and we've also done some alternative protein um, projects, most notably recently, the improved variety of village chicken, um, breeding a local chicken for its disease resistance with a, a larger bodied French variety to get sort of 10 kilo disease resistant chickens. So we've done quite a lot of work, a lot of it funded by the EU Ecofax 6 um, in Tridom area um, and around the jar where Stephanie Britton has also been working. So we all, of course, from our experience, um, we all know that the, the, the wild meat issue is a landscape wide problem and a transboundary often and regional. 
And our responses are often um, rather smaller than that, shall we say, um, for a lot of different reasons. I mean, all of us have worked long term in these places, are familiar with the experience of going to communities with an idea to bring in some alternative protein activities or income generating activities and finding out that several other activities have been implemented in the past and even the reasonably recent past, which have more or less disappeared. You find an old hen house or a broken beehive or something. So, you know, it's not for want of trying that these things have not really taken hold. Um, a lot of effort has gone in and a lot of very good work is being done. But, you know, in my own experience, in 20 years of working in Western Central Africa, I've seen projects for guinea pigs, rabbits, cane rats, snails, chickens, dikers, pigs, all sorts of animals attempted to be used for alternative protein uh, activities. So have disappeared without trace for one reason or another. A lot of the time we say there's not the, the, the funding cycle, um, the short term funding, you can't, you can't develop the project because they need three to five years. But, you know, in, for example, in the Trident, there'd be multi-generational EU funding cycles of five years for the last 30 years. So there's been a lot of resource put into that. But still, um, the, the sort of responses to the problems, to the conservation problems, are not to the appropriate scale. So I, have, I see a lot of those project cycles really as missed opportunities that we could have used to really engage in meaningful project design with the local communities. Um, so, you know, these funding cycles come and go in between. It's very common that after a large funding cycle is finished, you just find some broken down buildings and some abandoned vehicles. And most field activities have stopped for the 18 months or longer that it takes for the next one to come along. It often then has a slightly different focus. So there's not a continuity of approach even between those large funding cycles. Um, and, you know, and there are a lot of very good reasons why it is like that. But um, in response to that, we need to be trying harder. To, to use those resources in a way that we think is going to work better. Um, you know, there's a lot of really good work being done but at these small scales, really, really good work by very dedicated people, including the ZSL team and, um, and other people. So, you know, the willingness is there and the resources are potentially there, but there's a sort of something that's missing, which is we need this larger scale. It's expensive, it's time consuming, but, you know, we need to harness the resources that are there. There's no silver bullets, there's no quick fixes. And this, this document doesn't, pretend to be that um, but what it does do is it brings the processes that we know are required the things that we use into a step-by-step -step practical document so it's going to break down these complex procedures like situational analyses stakeholder analyses fpic free prior informed consent theory of change and break them down into these five steps with with checklists and questions that you must answer before you proceed to the next one so that a lot of that sort of background work is done so that it's, it's a more accessible way to doing the things that we do anyway, but in a way that doesn't, it's not so time consuming. Um, it can be done more quickly. It can be rolled out better. Um, I think, you know, refining, constantly refining the process by answering these questions and then moving on to the next step is, is really a great um, advance in terms of project design because you don't need to then go back all the time answering the same questions. You know, you've already got the process. The thing that I think is very important, of course, is the monitoring and evaluation at each stage and the very early engagement with communities. So you don't go to communities with a shopping list and say, we think the following things might be good for you. Which one do you like? You know, it's got to be better done than that. You've got to go there and say, you know, work with the communities, looking at things that, that make sense to them right from the beginning. So that there's no feeling that's being imposed at any stage, even though a lot of people think they do do that. You know, a lot of people say they do FPIC. A lot of people say they do community um, collaboration. But actually, they're going in at a, at a stage where they've already decided what's the sort of thing they want to do. They're not going in early enough. And I think this, the research that Steph has done and the document that, that has been produced, I think, really highlights that, which I think is very important, that you've got to really do the groundwork early um, before you start. And, you know, it's a toolkit. It's not a set of instructions. It's not that everyone is going to look the same like an Ikea coffee table. You know, it's not you put it together and there it is. No, it, you're, going to, it, you're going to adapt it. You're going to answer the questions. The answers will be different in each case. The background research that you do will feed into the refining of the process, feed into the theory of change. The theory of change for each project, each area will be different. But those are the, the sort of processes that you need to use in order to capture in this document. 
And um, so I think there's checklists, questions, guide to thinking, um, looking at the sort of results chains, I think very important. And um, um, it's, it, it's, it's sort of, it's not something that's gonna sit on the bookshelf, it's a practical guide. So we're all gonna go on and do great work in other places and get our professorships and, you know, direct reception conservation organizations, but that document needs to be being used by the people who are implementing these projects on the ground. It needs to be refined. It's step one in a long process, and there'll be other documents to follow about urban bushwick markets, that sort of thing. This document's in version two. Um, you know, we need to feed back from the, from the results of what we're going to do by following this process to then refine that document and make it even more user-friendly, more useful. Um, so for me, as somebody who's overseen a lot of implementation and um, often seen it failing or not really being maximized, I think this is an important step. I think it uses the existing expertise, refining it and bringing it back to the sort of go to the communities, talk to the communities, ask the communities, use the resources that are available to, to do a better job, I think really, um, of what we are already doing. And I, I would compliment all of the great work that's been done in this project and in many other projects, tried them in other places in Western Central Africa, which is where I know. Um, and, you know, I, I know that we will do better. And I think that this document will help us to do better. Thanks. Thank you so much, Andrew. That's, um, that's a great kind of endorsement to, to round off the webinar. And I think we're very well aware of the need for you know, tackling this issue at scale and very well aware that this piece of research is a tiny part of the bigger jigsaw um, that we need to address. But I think we've all seen the debris of failed conservation and development projects, abandoned buildings, abandoned all sorts. Um, and so I think anything that can be done to improve the effectiveness of those um, you know, is, is absolutely critical in terms of, of starting to get the, the right pieces of the jigsaw into place. And, and I completely agree with you, doing the groundwork, whether it's an alternative meat project or any kind of intervention, doing your groundwork with communities is an absolutely crucial first step. We're well aware that there's loads that need to be done and David is putting lots of stuff in the chat about the need to focus on urban consumers and very, very aware of that issue but we do also need to focus on the rural as well and get things right at, at both sides of the spectrum so um yeah we do very much hope that this will be a small contribution to that so on that we're now out of time it just leaves me to um thank everybody for participating and thank our panelists ej steph tebow and jasmine and also our respondents julia and andrew um, and um, I hope this was interesting and um, we very much look forward to getting feedback from people on, on the tool and on the surveys and, and on the, the webinar itself. So thanks very much, everybody. <laughs>